My name is David Lieberman. I'm the Chief of Gastroenterology at Oregon Health and Science uh, University. And I am honored to participate in this effort by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to improve the quality of colorectal cancer screening. For those of you who do not know me, uh, I am a past president of the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy and a current member of the governing board of the American Gastroenterological Association, or the AGA. I have been a participant in the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable for many years. I served as uh, chair of the Multi-Society Task Force on Colorectal Cancer for six years and participated in the development of colorectal cancer screening and surveillance guidelines. My research has focused on colorectal cancer screening, surveillance, and quality. We now have uh, compelling evidence that colon cancer screening works. It reduces uh, the incidence and mortality of colorectal cancer, but only if it's performed with high quality. The topics that we're going to be covering include ensuring that colonoscopy is appropriate and indicated, that the importance of a good bowel prep and the role of split dosing, the importance of complete documentation and the role that that plays in communication with primary care physicians and patients to determine when the next exam is appropriate, and the need to improve the quality of colonoscopy and monitoring quality indicators. So let's start out talking about uh, considerations before you perform a colonoscopy to ensure that the exam is appropriate, it's at the appropriate interval, and that the patient is medically appropriate uh, for the procedure. Um, the other elements to think about prior to the examination are optimizing the bowel prep and then managing any patient med medications and other conditions. Um, so is the colonoscopy exam appropriate now? And so, we have recommended uh, screening intervals based on the age uh, and family history that uh, we discussed uh, in part one. And I'll give you, show you an example of how you can go back to the earlier slide. So for patients that are uh, average risk, uh, we have uh, several screening options, but the recommendation for performing colonoscopy uh, is at 10-year intervals if the baseline exam was a normal examination uh, and was complete to the cecum. So you can use this method to go to additional slides and then when you're done looking at that slide, uh, those slides will have a go back message and just return to the primary uh, slide show. Um, we also discussed in the last, in part one, uh, the recommended surveillance intervals uh, for patients that uh, have had prior polyps including those uh, that have had prior uh, adenomas. And I'll go to the slide that shows that, um, which highlights uh, low and high-risk individuals. So patients that have one or two adenomas less than 10 millimeters and their baseline examination represent a low-risk group, and they can have colonoscopy in five to 10 years after that baseline examination. Whereas those that have three or more adenomas or adenomas greater than 10 millimeters or with villous features or high-grade dysplasia represent a higher risk group and they should have colonoscopy performed at three-year intervals. So I encourage you to use the, uh, the links provided uh, on this uh, slide set which enable you to uh, move to additional slides. If uh, the examination is going to be performed at a different interval than guidelines have recommended, we encourage that you to include a reason for deviating from the uh, recommended guidelines. And there can be many good reasons for deviating, but this should be documented in the medical record. Today, many patients are referred directly for colonoscopy uh, in so-called direct access. And um, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about the circumstances under which you should think about seeing the patient prior to the scheduling of the colonoscopy. So elderly patients have a higher risk, and elderly over 75 have a higher risk uh, associated with colonoscopy. Pla patients that are getting anticoagulation 
or can, and cannot safely stop their medications. Patients that have had recent infections or active cardiac, renal, pulmonary, or liver disease. Um, patients that have had a prior history of difficulty with sedation or anesthesia. Uh, patients that have had poorly prepped colons in the past. These are all situations in which um, you may need to take some special precautions and you may need to take some special measures to ensure that you can perform a safe and effective colonoscopy examination. The bowel preparation is perhaps one of the most mundane topics related to colonoscopy and it is the most important. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about the reasons this is so important. The consequences of a Poor prep include uh, difficulty actually performing the colonoscopy itself, prolonged procedure time, um, reduced rates of uh, completing the exam to the cecum, uh, the need for repeat procedures at a shortened interval, and most important, a reduced ability to detect important pathologies such as polyps or cancer. We have evidence that the bowel prep is inadequate in up to 25% of patients undergoing colonoscopy in the United States. And this is an important factor associated with uh, the possibility of developing interval lesions after colonoscopy. There are several types of bowel prep. Uh, there are uh, so-called isoosmotic full volume preps. And these isoosmotic preps uh, are basically not absorbed. Uh, and so there's full volume, which is generally four liters, lower volume uh, preps, and, and then hyperosmotic preps. The important uh, message, though, about the prep is that the instructions need to be clear and they need to be understood by the patient. So they have to be at an appropriate literary literacy level. Um, there have been many innovative approaches taken to try to improve the quality of the bowel prep, and I encourage you to look at some of these links. Uh, one is a YouTube uh, video uh, that uh, talks about the preparation for colonoscopy, and then there are e actual examples from several centers uh, showing bowel prep instructions that are given to patients. We hope that these uh, additional materials will be helpful to you in advising your patients about bowel preps. There's evidence that uh, using patient navigators uh, can improve both the adherence and the quality of screening examinations. So these navigators um, can be effective not only in uh, communicating uh, and helping patients navigate through the system, but they can be a way of helping uh, communicate uh, information about the bowel prep, which as I said is so critical to the performance of a high quality exam. Um, in many studies, there's been evidence that navigators help get patients scheduled, they help get the appropriate tests done, and uh, help with transportation, language issues, uh, and as I said, bowel prep and, and getting patients ready. So this is uh, something to, to think about in your practice, and it may help, uh, it may help with uh, improving the effectiveness of the overall screening experience for your patients. So we have a question, what is the preferred bowel prep dosing schedule for colonoscopy? And the answer is that the uh, split dose prep is clearly now preferred over any other method and that applies to all of the various bowel uh, cleansing preparations. So it's now recommended in uh, several guidelines, and the concept here is that half of the laxative is taken on the evening prior to the examination, and the remainder is taken uh, in the morning of the procedure. The colonoscopy can be performed two to four hours after the last dosing, and uh, it's a more effective and better tolerated uh, than the full dose uh, um, evening dosing that used to be used. In studies, it's been demonstrated to be superior for both the isoosmotic PEG, uh, high and low volume, as well as osmotic. So it really should be used for any form of PrEP that you are considering. And here's the evidence. This comes from a meta-analysis uh, that showed that, uh, number one, that the PrEP cleansing was better 
far superior. Number two, patients were less likely to discontinue the PrEP. Uh, number three, that patients were more willing to repeat it with the PrEP. And number four, they had fewer side effects. So if you look at this slide, this is a win, 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 win situation. And there should be no doubt now that split dose PrEPs uh, should be used uh, in practice. Um, there are potential barriers to split dosing PrEPs that have been raised uh, that we uh, believe are not significant concerns. One is patient acceptance, uh, because this may require the patient to wake up in the middle of the night to take the second dose prior to an early morning procedure. But when patients have been surveyed, more than 85% are willing to get up in the middle of the night to take the second dose. And for those that are not, you may want to consider scheduling into an afternoon procedure. A second concern is, am I going to have difficulty during the transportation from home uh, to the endoscopy center to have my procedure and need to make several stops along the way? And most of the evidence suggests that there's very little difference uh, between taking the full dose in the, in the evening or having the split dose uh, prep. So it's a matter of timing and understanding how far the patient needs to go, and this is where a patient navigator may be very helpful. Uh, there is a potential risk of increased uh, of risk of aspiration during sedation because patients may still have some liquid in their stomach. However, the anesthesia guidelines uh, do allow for ingestion of clear liquids up until two hours before sedation, and that is more than sufficient for patients undergoing a bowel prep. So most of these alleged barriers are really not a barrier to split dosing, and we strongly urge that split dosing be used in practice. For those patients that are going to have an afternoon examination, uh, the um, prep can be given part of it in the evening before and then part of it in the morning uh, before uh, the procedure, ending more than two hours uh, before the scheduled colonoscopy should begin. What about diet? Um, there are, uh, are various diet regimens that have been uh, recommended. Uh, the optimal pre-procedure diet is still really not well defined. Um, most experts would consider going on a clear liquid diet for 24 hours prior to the examination or having a very light uh, but low fiber breakfast on the day before the procedure followed by clear liquids. The important message I think to patients is that they need to drink a lot during that day before the procedure and that will help make the bowel prep, the laxative, much more effective. How do you predict if somebody's going to have a bad prep? Well clearly if somebody's had a bad prep in the past they may be likely to have it again but there are other patient characteristics that may help help you determine that you need to do some special prep uh, considerations. Patients that are in the hospital tend to be difficult to prep and I think this is partly because they're not moving around very much and uh, they may be on medications that can slow down the gut. The elderly, the obese, patients with lower levels of education tend to have uh, less adequate preps. Patients with a history of constipation, patients that are using antidepressants, particularly those that may have an anticholinergic effect, and patients that are on chronic narcotics. Uh, narcotics slow down the bowel and can make prepping very difficult. And then, of course, patients that are not compliant with their medications may also uh, have difficulty with the prep. This is another area where patient, having a patient navigator uh, can help address some of these issues, but special considerations may be needed uh, for some individuals if you can anticipate that they're going to have a bad prep. So how can you improve the prep for patients that have had a prior poor prep? Well, there are really no good studies, but there, are, there is evidence that the navigator and patient education work. Uh, you can increase the total volume of the, of the laxative solution from two to four liters if it's a low dose to, or four to six liters if it's a higher dose. Split dosing, as I mentioned, is very effective. Ensuring adequate hydration is absolutely important. Um, and then potentially adding other agents such as magnesium citrate or Miralax the evening before uh, beginning the prep so that would be two days before the procedure, uh, may help uh, with the bowel prep. 
Uh, adding a bisicodal or senna uh, to help with evacuation can help some patients that have constipation. And then extending the period of diet modification from 24 hours uh, to 48 hours. So these are all individual considerations that should be, you should think about in patients where there's either a past history of poor prep or you anticipate a poor prep for the reasons that we have talked about. Other things to think about prior to the colonoscopy are special precautions. And we have a, a link to slides for each one of these areas. So for example, if somebody is on anticoagulants, you need to think about whether they can be safely stopped over a period of several days or whether the patient has to be bridged. For patients on, uh, that are taking diabetes medications, uh, we generally recommend that they will be taking half of their medication on that day before the procedure because they're not going to be eating any food. Uh, antibiotic prophylaxis, uh, we rarely need to do, but there are certain circumstances. And each one of these items has a link to a slide that will take you to the established recommendations. Uh, one area where I, I think is very important are patients that are taking uh, oral iron for any reason. Um, iron is very difficult to clear during the prep, and so we recommend that iron, oral iron medications be stopped at least seven to 10 days uh, before the patient has uh, their colonoscopy. And cardiac devices, we have a couple of slides describing uh, the management, and you should be working closely with your cardiology colleagues uh, to help manage uh, some of these devices uh, at the time of the procedure uh, to make sure that all precautions are taken. What about sedation? Well, there are several options for sedation, including conscious sedation and uh, deeper sedation with propofol. Uh, propofol has become popular in the United States because it has a very rapid onset of action and a very rapid recovery. So patients sleep during the procedure and then they wake up very quickly after the procedure is completed. Um, it's probably necessary for a small fraction of patients who cannot be effectively sedated uh, with moderate sedation or, or at an increased risk for sedation, uh, with, for moderate sedation. So these could be individuals that have a prior history of difficulty uh, with moderate sedation, cannot tolerate those medications, um, or are on chronic uh, narcotics, and therefore would be difficult to sedate with moderate sedation. The major limitation uh, with propofol is the possibility of moving from, um, from deep sedation into general anesthesia with respiratory depression. Uh, in most states, uh, there's a requirement that anesthesia personnel uh, be available, um, and that could incre substantially increase the cost of the procedure. Uh, propofol is not covered uh, by all insurers, and often only for specific indications. So what are those indications? And they can include patients that have uh, dependence on uh, opiates and sed sedatives, uh, like benzodiazepines. Uh, that have significant neuropsychiatric uh, disorders, uh, that have had a negative experience with prior sedation efforts, drug or alcohol abuse. The extremes of age, very young and very uh, old patients um, may benefit from having a careful sedation with uh, propofol. Uh, pregnancy, uh, morbid obesity uh, because of the difficulties of uh, managing these patients with uh, conscious sedation. And anybody that is going to be uncooperative or if the procedure is going to be complex or lengthy, uh, at least you should think about uh, the use of propofol. Uh, finally, uh, increased risk of airway obstruction uh, should be also considered as a potential reason for considering propofol. So um, we're going to move on to some of the quality elements of the colonoscopy report. And so the question posed here is what elements should be documented in every report. And the quick and simple answer to this is these are elements that should be, that will be communicated to other physicians and to the patient and will help direct the uh, subsequent management of that individual, including the appropriate interval for the next examination. So the, exam the documentation, which seems like a, a fairly simple step, becomes a very important step uh, as part of a quality practice. 
and we should ensure that all the key elements are noted uh, because it facilitates communication uh, with physicians and the patient and also allows uh, monitoring of performance uh, to compare with other practices. So what are uh, some of these elements? Well, we have tried to define these elements in a paper that we published uh, several years ago, and the link to this paper is provided uh, on this slide. Uh, this was designed uh, after the uh, development of similar uh, reporting systems for um, radiology and mammography. And so it's a fairly simple system that includes uh, key elements from the pre-procedure, intra-procedure, and post-procedure periods. And so we're going to talk about uh, each one of those. So in the pre-procedure report elements, uh, the patient, uh, the endoscopist should document uh, the informed consent, the patient demographics such as age, sex, and race, and, um, and then any appropriate measures that are needed for management of anticoagulation, uh, cardiac uh, devices, and diabetes, so that these elements of precaution are carefully documented in the medical record. There should be some assessment of the uh, patient risk comorbidity. Many physicians use the anesthesia classification, um, which defines uh, five different groups of patients. Uh, and, and, and most patients that have endoscopy will be either ASA class one, two, or three. Um, an evaluation of the airway has been recommended by our anesthesia colleagues. And then some documentation that there's been a, a recent history in physicals so that if there are any new medical problems, uh, we're aware of those problems. There are several categories uh, for the indication for the procedure. Uh, screening refers to patients who are asymptomatic, who do not have a personal history of either adenomas or colorectal cancer. This could include patients with uh, or without a family history of colorectal cancer or adenomas. But also include uh, patients that are asymptomatic but have had some other positive screening tests, such as a fecal occult blood test, uh, fecal immunochemical test, sigmoidoscopy, barium, enema, stool DNA, or CT colonography. These patients are still asymptomatic, but if those tests are positive, that is an indication for a colonoscopy. A second major category for indication would be surveillance, patients that had a prior personal history of either colorectal cancer or adenomas, and if possible, the details about when those diagnoses were made and what was found on prior examinations help guide uh, the subsequent uh, management for that individual. Um, this also includes patients that have uh, chronic ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease uh, and the intervals for performing those exams uh, should be at, at about every two years uh, after the patients have had disease for eight years. Finally, the diagnostic category, these are patients that have had uh, signs or symptoms uh, that of lower GI disease that could include colorectal cancer um, and or other diseases. And in this case, the specific signs or symptoms uh, should be specified in the medical record. The other uh, pre-procedure elements that should be documented would be any prior colonoscopy uh, history and a detailed family history. And the uh, rationale for the family history, as I mentioned, is that it could identify patients that were, are going to need more frequent uh, examinations based on the age of the index family member uh, that, had the, uh, that had cancer or high-risk polyps. Um, if there is an indication that uh, does not seem to fit into guidelines, uh, or the exam is being performed before the recommended interval, um, this deviation from the guidelines should just be documented. There are many good reasons for deviating from guidelines, but the important message is that it should be documented in the medical record. During the procedure itself, uh, there are certain elements that should be documented, uh, including the bowel prep type and, uh, and some assessment of bowel prep. So was, this, was the final bowel prep good enough, good or excellent, for each segment of the colon? And um, 
and if not, uh, was every effort made to try to convert a fair prep into a good prep during uh, the withdrawal of the instrument and cleaning during the procedure. So um, this is an important part of the documentation of the procedure. So how, how to rate the bowel prep? And there have been several methods used. One is just an excellent, good, fair, and poor uh, ex examination with fair being defined as adequate to detect polyps greater than five millimeters after queening. Um, the second method has been uh, to simplify this by just saying it was either adequate to detect lesions greater than five millimeters or inadequate to detect lesions greater than five millimeters. There's a more rigorous method that has been developed called the Boston Bow Prep Score. And this is a, uh, a scoring system that's used after the bow has been queened uh, during the withdrawal of the instrument. Uh, the important thing about this scoring system is that it has been linked to, uh, the, uh, to what happens after the procedure, the development of polyps later and the development of interval cancers. And so uh, this is a report that uh, I think allows you to assess each segment of the colon. So you give a grading system for three different segments of the colon and you can differentially assess whether you've seen all or part of the colon uh, adequately. Finally, there should be some documentation of the extent of the exam. Ideally, there should be photo documentation of the cecum that includes the appendiceal orifice and the ileocecal valve. The photo shown here shows the uh, ileocecal valve at the very top or around 12 o'clock um, in this photograph. Um, if you did not reach the, segment, the cecum, you should document how far you got by anatomic segment. And if the cecum is not reached, uh, a reason should be provided for not reaching the cecum. Um, also, there should be documentation of the sedation used, uh, the dosage, and uh, the withdrawal time after you've reached the cecum. The reason for documenting withdrawal time is that there has been a relationship uh, between the withdrawal time and the adenoma detection rate. And so having an adequate withdrawal of at least six minutes is recommended by uh, most experts. Finally, it's been recommended by most experts to perform retroflexion in the rectum and to document that to be able to see perianal uh, pathology. The other elements include a description of all the findings uh, in enough detail that a reader can understand uh, what was found. So for example, for polyp descriptors, that would include uh, measuring the size of the polyp or an estimate of the size of the polyp based on endoscopy, the location, and, and the appearance of the, uh, of the polyp. So this is an example of some of the descriptors that one might think about. Uh, showing an example of a pedunculated polyp, a sessile polyp, and then a very flat uh, polyp uh, shown on the bottom. So these descriptors uh, should be included uh, in the report. The method of removing polyps should also be documented so that uh, if uh, a snare was used, did you, was cautery used uh, or not, um, was injection used to raise a lesion, uh, was the resection complete? Uh, did it need to be performed in several pieces, so-called piecemeal uh, resection? Um, any suspicious lesion in the colon, and by this I would mean any lesion greater than two centimeters, uh, should uh, be uh, tattooed uh, with India ink and so that it will be easy to go back and reinspect that area on a subsequent examination. Uh, the only exceptions to tattoo would be if the lesion is in the cecum itself where you have other anatomic landmarks like the appendix and the oil valve or in the rectum itself where you know exactly where you are. The, f the other question uh, that should be addressed in the report is whether the polyp was actually retrieved uh, for a pathological examination. So when we retrieve polyps, we need to give our pathologists uh, important information uh, about the pathology specimen. And pathologists need to know the colon description of the lesion that we removed, uh, 
uh, the morphology, whether we think it was completely removed, and what portion of the colon it was taken from. And we provide some examples here of descriptors that might be used uh, to communicate to your pathologists. So it's important that they have as much information as we have at the time that they're examining this. There's some controversy about whether pathology specimens can be pooled into one jar. Um, most experts would say that if a polyp is greater than five millimeters, it should probably be placed in its own vial. There are situations where there's a cluster of polyps in one portion of the colon that are all diminutive, less than five millimeters, and some experts believe that it's reasonable to pool some of those polyps into uh, one jar to reduce the cost of the pathology. After the procedure, uh, it's important to provide recommendations for follow-up based on the patient's history, their age, their comorbidity, and the colonoscopic uh, findings. Uh, in many cases, this is going to have to be delayed until after the pathology results are available and you know what type of polyp uh, that you are dealing with. Um, the, the recommendations for follow-up should be consistent with evidence-based guidelines, but if for some reason you think that the examination should be performed at a different interval, then you should provide a reason for deviating from those guidelines. Those uh, recommendations and results should be communicated uh, very clearly to both the patient and to the referring provider and ideally, there should be a follow-up for uh, any adverse events occurring uh, after the procedure is completed. In terms of recommending um, appropriate follow-up, one of the issues that should appear in every report so that any reader can look at it uh, is, was the exam complete to the cecum? Was the bowel prep adequate? And were the polypectomies complete? Because if they were not, then that may be reason uh, that there will need to be a shorter interval for the next examination. And that shorter interval would be uh, exams that would be performed in two or two to six months after the procedure. Um, in patients that where the cecum was not reached, who are average risk, should those patients have yet another colonoscopy or some other examination? And the answer is not clear. Um, um, these patients are still average risk, so they may benefit from having a high sensitivity GWIAC FOBT or fecal immunochemical test. Um, many physicians would use a, another examination like CT colonography to view that portion of the colon uh, that was not uh, adequately seen. And um, so I think the, in these, the management of these patients uh, should be individualized. In the next slide, we discuss the appropriate follow-up uh, for an incomplete examination. And there are several options um, for patients that, for those patients that had an adequate bowel prep, but there, it just wasn't technically possible to complete the exam due to a tortuous colon or prior surgery, adhesions, or various uh, colon diseases. Uh, the options include uh, using a, a capsule uh, that can be swallowed, uh, the so-called PillCam colon, uh, that allows uh, visualization of the colon, uh, or performing a CT colonography um, to visualize that portion of the colon uh, that was not adequately uh, seen. Um, the, in patients where the exam was incomplete due to ineffective sedation, uh, that's an exam that might be repeated in the future using uh, deeper sedation uh, with propofol and other sedation uh, medications. Um, the key point is that if a high quality exam is completed and it's negative, the patient does not need to have another exam again uh, for 10 years if they're uh, average risk. The next slide poses a question. In an average risk uh, patient who has a complete colonoscopy with no findings, uh, should you recommend an interim stool test before uh, his or her next colonoscopy is due uh, in 10 years? Um, the key message here is that patients that have 
a negative colonoscopy who are average risk, you have a very low risk of developing any serious colon pathology for 10 years or more. And therefore, uh, they probably do not need any screening um, during that 10-year uh, period. Um, there is no evidence that supports the performance of an interim test, such as uh, fecal copoid testing or fecal immunochemical testing prior to the next uh, colonoscopy. There are other groups where the management of these patients uh, might be different. And so <coughs> patients that have a family history with a first degree relative who was less, who had cancer at age less than 60, those individuals should have examinations at five year intervals. And then we've talked earlier about patients that have adenomas, serrated polyps, or a history of colon cancer. Those patients will have examinations uh, at shorter intervals based on uh, the significance of the lesion that was found on their examination. What about patients that had only a fair prep at the baseline colonoscopy? Here we have little or no published guidance or evidence uh, to guide us. And so it comes down to clinical judgment. The follow-up for these individuals should be individualized uh, based on the patient's age, their comorbidities, and the goals of the procedure as well as the risk. So for example, an elderly patient, um, it, it may be that the goal of that procedure is to detect important lesions. And you might be satisfied if you felt that the exam was sufficient to detect uh, important polyps or growths in the colon, then that patient, even though the prep was fair, may not need another examination. In uh, selected cases, it may be very appropriate to recommend that the patient return earlier than the interval recommended. And this could include younger patients uh, who have a much longer lifespan ahead of them and may be more likely to benefit uh, from a high quality exam. If the exam was only fair though, then it's worth considering whether these patients will need to have uh, special prep instructions to assure that that next exam is really a, an excellent or good uh, bowel prep. The communication with patients and referring physicians about uh, subsequent recommendations uh, cannot be emphasized enough. Um, there should be clear communication about what was found and the implications of those results in terms of next steps. So a summary of the findings should be provided for both the patient uh, and for the referring physician and a, recommendation, a very clear recommendation for the next uh, examination should be included uh, with, that, with that note to both the patient and the referring uh, provider. Uh, after the colonoscopy, uh, when the patient is awake, uh, it's uh, important to discuss the major findings of the procedure, whether it was adequate, uh, whether polyps were removed, and, and when those results will be available, and what to do in the following days in terms of diet, medications, driving, etc. Uh, and what to look out for, particularly uh, any complications of, of a procedure such as bleeding uh, or perforation or pain uh, should be, the patient should understand uh, with clear instructions what to do if those things uh, were to happen. Um, the patient should be given written discharge instructions uh, that tell the patient what to do should any of these uh, serious adverse uh, events uh, occur. If possible, uh, capturing what happens to the patient over the next 30 days uh, should be done. Um, we realize that this is not feasible in many uh, clinical practices, uh, but it would certainly be valuable to know if patients had any serious events occur uh, within the 30 days uh, after they've completed a colonoscopy. Um, finally, this communication should occur in writing so that there's no misunderstanding of what was being found and what is being uh, recommended to both the patient uh, and uh, the referring provider. So the communication uh, of, with patients uh, should be in a written form, ideally, uh, that uh, provides uh, 
them information about when they need to uh, return based on, on their risk level. Um, depending on the findings, it may be important to encourage the patient to talk to their family members about the importance of these findings because it may have implications for the family member. So for example, if the patient has colorectal cancer, uh, they should be notifying uh, their family members because those family members are going to be at increased risk for colorectal cancer themselves and should be initiating screening at a younger age and more intensively. So as part of the communication with the patient, uh, encouraging them to speak to their family uh, about the findings uh, is an important part of that communication. Finally, reminder systems are very important and they work. Uh, we have very good evidence from a variety of studies that uh, getting patients back at appropriate intervals using uh, computerized reminder systems uh, are very effective. But what's, what's also effective is making sure that the patient knows when they need to come back. And because patients may leave a practice or they may leave a city and go somewhere else uh, during a five or 10 year period, uh, it's important that the patient understand when they are due for their next examination so that it's done appropriately. Moving on to uh, the quality of colonoscopy and how to monitor quality. A few questions to think about as we discuss this section. First, are some endoscopists better than others at finding adenomas? What is the minimum adenoma detection rate that you should achieve for screening examinations in average risk individuals? And what should you do if the bowel prep quality is only fair or poor in more than 10% of your patients? So, the need to improve the quality of colonoscopy has been highlighted by variation in practice. We know from a variety of studies that there is wide variation among endoscopists who are performing screening examinations in similar types of patients uh, where we would expect to have rather consistent results. So the variation includes the detection of polyps, the ability to reach the cecum, the quality of the bowel prep, the appropriateness of the screening and surveillance recommendations after the procedure, and the completeness of reporting. So there is room to improve quality. How can it be improved? And there are, I, there are several methods, but certainly uh, having a continuous quality improvement program within your practice will enable you to monitor performance of the endoscopist in your practice, uh, compare with uh, benchmarks and national targets, and then take steps to improve performance when it is needed. Um, there are recommendations from the U.S. Multi-Society Task Force on Colorectal Cancer, as well as the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable about elements that should be measured, and very recently a new publication uh, in 2014 on the quality indicators for colonoscopy are included uh, in the links uh, provided uh, on this uh, slide set. So what should be monitored? And the highest priority items uh, include the adenoma detection rate, the sequel intubation rate, the quality of the bowel prep, and the use of appropriate intervals uh, after uh, screening and surveillance is completed. And some of these have now become measures of CMS quality programs, such as the Physician Quality Reporting System, or so-called PQRS, uh, that many of us uh, need to provide uh, reports to. So let's talk about the adenoma detection rate. Um, what is it? It's really the uh, rate of finding adenomas in uh, average risk uh, screening examinations. The current target uh, that is recommended in the 2014 recommendations are that it should be greater than 30% for men who are undergoing screening examinations and greater than 20% for women undergoing screening examinations. Why is it important? It's important because it has been linked directly to the development of interval cancers in subsequent years after a colonoscopy. So perhaps the most important uh, quality indicator would be the rate of interval cancers, which is difficult to measure. 
But this is an excellent surrogate marker, which has been shown to have a direct relationship so that patients that, have, that are high detectors uh, above these targets have low rates of interval cancers in the next three to five years amongst their patients. Whereas patients that have low, that are low detect, physicians who are low detectors, uh, their patients have higher rates of interval cancer uh, F in the three to five years after their colonoscopy is completed. That is why this is important. That is why all of us should know what our adenoma detection rate is. Uh, the targets uh, highlighted in this slide uh, are new targets that were just published uh, recently in 2014 and represent uh, the most recent data uh, for screening examinations. What else should be monitored? Well, the CECO intubation rate represents an estimate of whether the exam is a complete exam. And if the exam is not complete, then important pathology uh, may be missed. So it's really defined as the percentage of exams uh, in which uh, the cecum was reached when it was intended to reach the cecum. The target for all examinations is greater than 90%. The target for screening and surveillance examinations is greater than 95%. And again, the reason this is so important is because uh, important lesions can be missed if the colonoscopy is uh, not complete. Um, how do you know if it's complete? I think that it's uh, most of the guidelines and experts uh, recommend that there be photo documentation that demonstrates uh, at least the, one of these features, the uh, ileocecal valve or the appendiceal orifice to demonstrate completeness of the exam. Quality of the bowel prep. Uh, we've talked about quality of the bowel prep uh, several times, uh, and it remains one of the most important targets uh, and one of the most important barriers to a highly effective colonoscopy. The, um, we recommend that all practices monitor the quality of their bowel prep and uh, the adequacy with a target of achieving greater than 90% either good, excellent, or adequate to detect lesions greater than five millimeters. Um, we mentioned that a poor bowel prep results in missed lesions, a need for repeat examinations at shorter intervals, which drives up the risk to patients as well as the cost. We recommend that if a practice has less than 90% of exams that are good, that you should look very carefully at the processes that are going, that are involved in uh, patient instructions uh, and the type of prep you're giving. So the prep should all be split dose preps, the instructions should be very clear, and you may want to consider the use of a patient navigator uh, to help the patient, uh, guide the patient through this process of the bowel prep which is so critical to a high quality examination. Uh, finally, the appropriateness of the screening and surveillance recommendations should also be monitored so that you have an idea of how often you're deviating from, these, uh, from the published guidelines that are based on evidence. We know that in, in certain situations, the uh, exams are performed at shorter intervals than are recommended, which has the potential for uh, wasting resources um, as well as the potential for harm with little benefit. And then there are other circumstances where a procedure should be performed more often in patients with higher risk lesions or incompletely removed lesions, and those patients would be at risk for development of cancer. So adhering to evidence-based guidelines should be a quality metric and reasons for deviating from that guideline should be provided as part of a high quality uh, report. The other things that should be monitored would be some of the descriptors, uh, whether or not the reporting um, elements are included in the report. So are, does the report indicate the uh, polyp descriptors? Uh, are the, is the polyp retrieval rate documented? Um, is the rate of repeat examinations in less than a year for poor or inadequate prep uh, documented? Are tattoos placed for large or suspicious lesions except in the cecum and rectum? So these are other parameters uh, that can be followed as part of a high quality 
colonoscopy practice. Uh, a paper was published several years ago to assist uh, physicians in what questions that they might ask uh, their endoscopist about the quality of their colonoscopy examinations. And so this paper is provided here as a reference uh, for you and the source document uh, can be obtained uh, to enable you to know what questions to be asking about colonoscopy quality. So a few final take-home points from this section of our, of our discussion. First, that, uh, follow, uh, that we should be following evidence-based screening and surveillance guidelines uh, to ensure that colonoscopy is performed at the appropriate time in the appropriate patient uh, based on the personal and family history. Second, that we should be working and striving for good to excellent bowel preps in all patients. Uh, split dose preps are strongly recommended. Uh, that every effort should be made during the examination itself to convert a fair prep into a good prep with cleaning during the procedure, even though that takes additional time during the procedure. And the, if the bowel prep quality is inadequate in more than 10% of patients, then it's important for practices to look at their uh, procedures to see if they can improve their educational materials, if they can improve uh, the navigation process uh, for uh, their patients. Uh, complete colonoscopy reports are essential for clear communication with both patients and referring providers so that the appropriate next steps can be taken at the proper interval. And the quality of colonoscopy is highly variable and therefore it's important for all of us to monitor performance uh, with quality indicators and quality metrics and then take steps to remediate when the benchmarks uh, are not achieved. I want to thank all of you for viewing and participating uh, in this course. I want to remind you that we have many resources uh, embedded in these documents uh, so that you can click on links that will take you to many wonderful source documents.